So we've had uh, two batting talks. Thank you, Patrick and Hilla. I don't know about you, I'm suffering from a little bit of information overload. Put your hands up if you are as well. So uh, just as a little, like, through, through process, perhaps we could all close our eyes. If you want to, optional, close your eyes and just repeat after me. This becomes relevant, by the way. And you might feel a bit better after. <clears throat> Life. Life. Health. Health. Happiness. Happiness. Open pathways. Open pathways. Life. Life. Health. Health. Happiness. Happiness. Open pathways. Open pathways. Health, in the body. Health in the body. Peace in the spirit. Peace in the spirit. Love, in the Love in the heart. It is this that we wish. That we wish. For, ourselves. For ourselves. For our friends and family. For our, and family. For our brothers and sisters. For, and sisters. For geese and crows. And for all humanity, may it be so. Can someone help me start the presentation? Because I don't speak Dutch. <laughs> Do you know, is it this one? This one here? Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. I have no interests to declare apart from a deep love of God and drugs and. Uh, <laughs> Spirit possession. <laughs> I'd like to start with a quote. Searching for what I need, and I don't even know what precisely that is, I went from person to person, and I saw them together have less than I who have nothing, and yet that I left to each of them a bit of that which I don't have and have been searching for all along. Such gracious bestowal is the office of those inner others who have been ascribed to the authorship of much in possession literature. The question regarding whether diamonds or genii or spiritual inspirations have their own interiority, which we kind of got at the end of that talk, that question, or whether they're separate to the person holding the pen, um, speaking the voice, um, um, so whether they're that, sorry, on the one hand, or fragments of unconscious material are as unanswerable as they are unput downable. So this talk will have three broad sections. Firstly, I will consider a typological spectrum, uh, a spectral spectrum, in terms of the hermeneutics of, 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 these stream, of streams of texts. It's not a talk on ontology or epistemology, but on literary perspective. So that's my get out of jail free card, if anyone asks. So with the help of contemporary scholar of literature, William Rowlandson, um, Dante and Swedenborg will be contrasted, and Jung's plethora of spirits will be picked apart a little bit in order to understand two works of LSD literature based in the 1990s. Finally, we will suggest the lessons which can be learned from the inner horizons outside of ourselves as creators going forward. So, in an essay on the occult, the Argentinian author and professor of English, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, makes a distinction between the real and the unreal in occult phenomena. So, between the actuality versus the poesis, which we spoke about earlier, of entity encounters. Borges casts Swedenborg, who some of you may know, as an authentic encounterer of the otherworldly, whereas Dante is a lyrical waxer for the sake of theological message. He rationalizes this on formal grounds. So Swedenborg wrote his prose in Latin, it was very dry, but it did concern his journey into angelic realms. Whereas Dante is a highly symbolized and stylized, uh, the, the, the Divine Comedy is a, is a highly symbolized and stylized text with each character carrying moral and parabolic overtones and undertones, tones generally. So uh, these types of entity encounter, he terms respectively the authentic and the willed. Um, another example could be found in Jung's Red Book. On the one hand, we have the prophets who appear to give knowledge about the world, which the protagonist cannot share until the revelation is at hand. And on the other, the guides, like the soul, who seem to share enmeshedly in the emotional life of the protagonist. Forgive me if I've botched that, Hiller, but that's just one illustration. William Rowlandson, um, in an essay on the daimonic imagination, in that uh, series of essays, has pointed out the possible inconsistency of this distinction. There is, he says, and I quote, a tension between the deep-rooted skepticism and fascination and respect for spiritual experience, which I think we can all share in the Borgesian dichotomy. For example, Borges himself maintained a skeptical agnosticism, yet believed that there was truth in the notion of received literature, as you put it earlier, Patrick. His iconoclasm and love of heresy in the face of his proposed 
distinction implies a deference for be being taken for credulous, Will Rowlandson argues, so he didn't want to come across as gullible. Nevertheless, Rowlandson continues, it is precisely this tension that creates the intellectual drive to explore the deeper mysteries of human experience. So Rowlandson continues, if we consider the imaginal as a site of reception, even as a sense, um, in both of the cases proposed by Borges, then something is still happening to us in tandem with us doing something. Um, passion and action are one. It's not so much that entities are created by the imagination as encountered through the imagination, and this encounter is, quoting Rollinson again, a creative process which gives form and context to a formless daimonic force, perhaps. We can broach and encroach on this distinction in application to two recent works of lysergic possession literature. The Southwark Mysteries, on the one hand, and uh, The Rose of Paracelsus by William Leonard Picard. Unlike the Swedenborg-Dante distinction, uh, where writing in verse involves mental creations and writing in prose seems to imply a genuine transportation to a place of otherworldly spirits, here we have the reverse. Um, verse which comes from entity possession and carefully crafted prose which objectifies fragments of personality. Um, the Southwark Mysteries involves an encounter through history with an underrepresented and abused minority in medieval and early modern London. It was performed on Shakespeare's birthday in the Globe Theatre in the millennium year and now has a following in the form of rituals which take shape around its central character, the goose. The revelations involved were catalyzed by LSD and have corresponded to real-world information hitherto unknown. For example, the location of the single women's graveyard, which its scenes center, and wherein the rituals now take place. That's where, that's where that is. So, The Rose of Paracelsus, on the other hand, is a semi-fictionalized autoethnography of a Harvard drug policy analyst who becomes convinced via entities somehow internal and external to him, of a utopian spirit lying within the sacrament of lysergic acid diethylamide. So one, the Southwark Mysteries, looks at redeeming the past from the condemnations of history, and the other looks to inventing a future worthy of the human spirit, but both involve an encounter with entities who seem to inhabit, though somewhat differently, a spontaneity all their own. When John Crow the author of the Southwark Mysteries is shamanic alias. When he received the vision, he'd prepared the psychological ground by imbibing the culture of his local time and place. The vision is thus as psychogeographic as it is psychedelic. And when the spirit, the goose, revealed herself, she manifested in the form of a medieval, um, in the, eventually in the form of a medieval genre, the mystery play, which originally sought to render the Jesus way and message understandable to the spirit of of the medieval world. But this spirit, the goose, also reveal, revealed the geographical location of an unconsecrated single women's and, uh, graveyard and pauper's burial pit, crossbones, where the goose's body had originally been dumped by the very bishop who had licensed her in the first place to solicit sex. So the incorporator of this spirit, John, didn't think much of this geographical uh, revelation considering real-world information less salient or relevant than the emancipatory force of the words, the poetic truth, until a few weeks later, the construction workers of the um, London Underground, the Jubilee Line, were digging for electricity pylons, and they discovered 15,000 human skeletons, most of whom children, and after that, women. A community now gathers to intone prayers from the mysteries and remember the very outcasts, dead and alive, who hold our society up through their sacrifice. The penultimate cruelty that a leader of a church profiting from prostitution in life would morally condemn it in death renders the book especially emancipatory. Not only was the play performed in 2010 in the, in the local cathedral church, um, in spite of the beggar Jesus swearing in the play, but now the local cathedral church, which is the church of St. Mary Overy, the matron saint of beggars, actors, ferrymen, and harlots come to commit an act of remorse, remembrance, and restoration, uh, regret, remembrance, and restoration every year uh, on Mary Magdalene Day. The goose is soteriological, that's the theological term for saving, and redemptive role as the bride of Christ so moved the local cathedral church, and especially their dean, 
that the whole play was actually performed within the church. And this is an example of what the CCRU have termed hyperstition, or a story that makes itself real. In many ways, the goose is a spirit of our sexually liberated times. Nevertheless, her entity has emerged from our past to remind humankind of the dark side of judgment, aspersion, money, consent, and repression or integration of the animal within. Quoting from the book, it is an example of God, man, and beast uniting for one moment in eternity. The premise of the mysteries, as in the medieval forebears, is that Judgment Day has descended, but this time on Southwark, in the location, what was named after the local prison, the, 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 the clink, the liberty of the clink. But Judgment Day does not go as expected. <laughs> It was in Southwark, the ferment of Shakespeare, where those amenities, bear pits, theatres, gambling dens, and brothels were allowed. Um, and the, of course, the city of London, where those were banned, is a gambling den, but let's not get beyond scope. In spite of, the, uh, of its local time and space, the stakes are cosmic and the themes metaphysical. It's all time that's descended on Southwark. The creation sequence at the beginning of the play, for example, very much sets the tone by in turning a protest, Eve, from Adam and Eve, Eve asks, did I fall or was I pushed? This question can be asked of entities generally. Does fate tempt us or us fate? Is the incorporation of a character outside of one's own uh, a passive or active process? It also brings with it implications of theodicy. Can notions of an omnipotent and omnibenevolent divinity be justified in the face of a cruel world? The goose as an incarnate spirit alerts us to the fact that a theological blame game, in this case of sexual mores and habits, which all too often result from a trauma which is externally imposed, merely continue the very evil which it seeks to condemn. And it exemplifies that the continued reality of trauma as haunting and ghostly, as incorporated into the identity of personality and place, can metamorphosize into a state of healing, catharsis, grace, and even redemption, but only if the universality and ubiquitousness of trauma is understood in its own agential terms, situated in particular places and particular times. Compassion, understanding, faith in the possibility of redemption can help us here, the book seems to suggest, yet such sea change revelations often require something external uh, to approach us, to move us, a real barrier. There is something that it is like not to be me with all my hang-ups and my judgments, my tendencies. And yet that subjectivity is just as real as my subjectivity. So in the mysteries, then, the text is explicitly received. Authorship is outsourced directly to a spirit who is also an ancestor, uh, like the aforementioned prophets. In the latter, Leonard, Leonard's book is a semi-fictionalized um, autoethnography as I mentioned, and uh, I, don't even, I don't even know where to, where to begin, but I'll, I'll have to. <laughs> um, so this Harvard drug policy analyst researches black markets, right, and, no, and, and novel illicit substances, but he keeps encountering these, these strange characters, and they're called the Six, a an, an ritual almost priesthood of chemists, right, who all occupy different religious and psychosexual frameworks. So from atheism to Buddhism, from Christianity to Hinduism, from Dionysian Tantra, which is a syncretism anyway, to monogamy, to celibacy. So all these characters which Leonard encounters, sorry, which the protagonist encounters, um, uh, have these different like, identities, both sexual and religious. So they could be seen as aspects of the protagonist's identity because they share in the emotional life and they share the LSD experience. So one of the characters, Crimson, is involved in the security. Vermilion is involved in the ritual preparation of the sacrament, for example. They intone prayers when they, when they make this LSD. Len, uh, Leonard wrote this book in prison. In 1999, he was accused of producing something like 90% of the world's LSD while at Harvard. Um, the book, of course, remains officially a fiction. The six chemists from the Rose... Um, appear to the protagonist as secretly hailing from a common mission, the widespread availability of LSD, 
um, considered in aggregate benign, and, um, and the sacrament synthesized with prayers known to all the, all the prayers intoned to all the known gods. And this is a sacrament which requires modern scientific knowledge and theological adeptness, the characters argue. Their common mission includes an acceptance of difference, um, and Jewish and Christian theology is mentioned in the same breath as Californian Buddhistic revivalism. Hedonistic partying, exorcismic sexual practices, which I've termed sexorcisms, go throughout the text. Um, but the most important take-home message from this text for me is that whenever the protagonist meets, meets each chemist, yes, he has either a contact high or he, he becomes high because they've, he's, they've shared a drink or something. It's ambiguous. But what follows these experiences is always a form of praxis, action in the world. For example, hacking international databases in counter-surveillance um, of of, because of data abuse, or, or helping to end someone's addiction, or bringing an abused orphan into a loving family who can love them free from trauma. Thus, his unique take on the trip report, which psychedelic culture has come to know so well, which kind of basically mixes Charles Dickens with Erowid, really bizarre, um, is, is not actually, the, 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 although it's entertaining and interesting and beautiful, it's not actually the take-home message for me, was that, that um, the, <laughs> the experience itself is, 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 is only the beginning. Um, within our awe, that's our, sorry, within our awe, we only know that all we own, we owe. The world consists not of things, but of tasks, and wonder is the state of being asked, the ineffable is a question addressed to us. That's from Heschel. So in this one aspect, in one episode in the story, after a transcendent trip in the Himalayas, where he's researching Ramdas actually, replete with vignettes on monasticism, desire, the similarities and incompatibilities between Eastern and Western religious thought, the real world poverty of the shanty town is looked at directly and not, you know, not ignored and not scoffed at, but compassionately acted upon. Thus does revelation turn into action. Thus does duty become desire. A young child is being abused by her parents and the chemist's friendship with another local family who are barren and desirous of a daughter renders their role in catalyzing a transfer of care, the organization of a new adoption for the child a practical manifestation of their religious revelation. The entities here, the chemists, seem to share in the emotional life of the protagonist. Religious identity morphs, but its core remains a call to manifest the luck of experience into the joy of being the change. To manifest the luck of experience into the sheer joy of being the change. In these two books, then, we have extremes in a spectrum of beliefs about what entities can be, both in themselves and for us. In the rose, we see the inner other, the multiplicity of the self, how a single psychological whole can surprise itself, exceed itself, communicate with itself. As one chapter puts it in their statement um, to the protagonist, one of the six describes it like stumbling through a mirror, a trackless mystery of no identities but is an identity of no one an identity of everyone? When the language of the six is commented upon, reference to the author's own plight is implied. As though he had spent years alone, removed, comforted only by literature. Leonard wrote this in prison. Pure vision risks becoming solipsistic and navel-gazing, if not coupled with a conversion of passion into action. Contrast that image stumbling through a mirror to one from the mysteries. Here's Christ in the gents, the toilets. He's down on his knees in the vomit and beer, scrabbling to put back together the broken pieces of the mirror. So in the mysteries, there's a visceral understanding of the commonality of the self in the accident of birth. We could be in that very sense and are anyone from those we abuse to those we help from those we have a, have a, who have abused us to, to those who have helped us. Yet we cannot understand the reality of together passion, compassion, without the temporary possession by the other, to see the world from the eyes of the radically other. In the rose, 
the plurality of singular identity is exposed, and entities become a part of one psychological tesseract. But in the mysteries, the unity of the self and the other is assumed, so that, in the words of Martin Buber, I become, through my relation to the thou, in saying I, I say thou. Both books represent diverse sides of a spectrum of beliefs about entities. In The Rose of Paracelsus, we carry the assumption so pithily by Walt Whitman that we contain multitudes, we contain multitudes, that there are psychologies within psychologies, that we can meet ourselves as other. But in The Goose, in, in The Mysteries with The Goose, The Goose shows us, that, and the practitioner, that there is a non-human world beyond our own which transcends the present moment and conjures in that real barrier a possibility for love at all, rendering history perennial. So where the mysteries show us the history of an abusive society, that, but that it can turn into a celebration of the liberated, the rose offers a vision of a fair, cognitively liberal future society. The role of psychedelics and sexuality in a rapidly changing ideological, natural, and globalizing environment becomes all the more important to understand and to imagine. We have to come to terms with our past as a culture while also embracing the deep, deep wellsprings of its tradition. As the late Mark Fisher once said, we have to invent the future. I implore us all as co-creators of the way the world is seen to pay close attention to the entities which may enter our lives so that the speed of the present becomes clear in the blurred edges which it moves against. Thank you.